But in the ancient world, uh, the fact that uh, a thing was beautiful was related to its function. If it if it actually lived up to serving the purpose that it was meant to serve, then it was beautiful. It was. It was not. It Give was not example. considered beautiful. All right, we're here on Watar. I got finally a guest. I've been couldn't wait to get on here. Father, you out there? Feeling good? Yeah, I'm feeling all right. How you this, doing, John? I'm good, brother. It's been it's been a while, years, right? Thirty years we've known each other. It's crazy, man. Yeah, I mean, you would, I, your 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 daughter is twenty one already. I don't remember her when she was like a little tiny tiny little, little big headed infant. Yeah. yeah. So this is Father Silouan, uh Justin Yano. He's an old friend. Uh, Father is a part of the Russian Church Abroad. Folks out there who don't know what that is. Sometimes it's abbreviated as Rokor. He's an Orthodox Christian, an artist, and a priest. He's originally from Puerto Rico. Uh, and he obtained a BFA, right, Father, from yeah, uh, from uh, the visual School of Arts, Visual Arts, yes, New York. Later on, a master's from Hunter College in New York. Uh, right now, you're the deputy abbot of the Monastery of Saint Dionysius, the, Ari- the Areopagite. Areopagite. And Father that's- Maximus is the abbot. Father Maximus Weimar is the abbot. That's right. And so you're out on Long Island, where you serve and where you pray and where you paint, right? That's right. That's right. So, but he's he's playing it cool. He is uh, well known in many artistic circles, especially in terms of Christianity. His articles have appeared in various publications here and abroad. And uh, one of you're an, a contributor to the Orthodox Arts Journal, a favorite of mine. Yeah, yeah. And so we can see you online because you're an artist, but you're also a priest. Maybe the priest first, or the second, and you're a celibate. You're you're a monk, right? That's right. That's right. So, Father, I I gotta just start with this. Everybody that comes on our show does this uh, the the lightometer exam. Uh, the li- the lightometer, man. You got yeah. some tricky questions in that one, man. <laughs> but you didn't take it yet, am I right? You I, just sort I, of read I, it over. I I, I actually. No, I heard your episode uh, when you interviewed your daughter. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And so, so you know, I was trying to keep track with the numbers in my head, but but I couldn't. So this is gonna be uh, a fresh a fresh one for me. So I wanna I wanna see how I I, I uh, yeah I do too. I display see- my colors here. Because <laughs> yeah. the cool part right now is that however you're about to display them. Okay. You're doing it from a monastery. I think people want to find out about that because I think they probably have some assumptions. Let's do it. You ready? Let's do it. Yes. Here we go. I have one. Let's see. Six, nine. I have nine as my end uh, result. All right. So what does that mean? All right. Here's what it means. I'm afraid, man. You are not. (laughs) You did not reach the status of a villager. A villager, wow. that would be saying the old world is deep in your bones. There's a really good chance you can't even exist in a mall. You're like <laughs> bust. You places like Algeria and Ethiopia will roll out the red carpet for you. This is not you. You okay. are not the shining city dweller on the hill. That would be as if you scored a six or lower. That would be someone who has a lot of hope for the modern world. You are what we call in the show the suburban. You oh, feel, man. Yeah, you feel ro- <laughs> romantic about the old world. But hierarchy is a word that you'd rather read about in a book. How about that? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it, feels that... You should, it feels you should want to obey your elders a lot more than you ask, Father, this is terrible. Yeah, I know. Isn't that it's, it's Individual. Amazing is more important than the is is not more important than the group but sometimes you feel like the group really got it wrong (laughs) yes suburban uh, i'm a suburban too i think i think this all relates to our conversation in very relevant ways because you know we inevitably have taken in elements of our immediate cultural 
a historical context. The paradigm that we inhabit inevitably is going to shape the way that we uh, look at the world. That is, that is neither here nor there, but it's just the realities. But we have to, we have to become aware of what the assumptions are to then better be able to, to make the choices that we should be making. So in some ways, you can't avoid being a Puerto Rican guy in America, on Long exactly. Island, yeah. no matter how faithful you might be to a particular. Uh, by the way, on this show, we call a religion a lig or a ligament, a right. type of way of seeing the world. So no matter how faithful you are, yeah. you're still that thing. Are you in agreement with that? Yeah. Well, we're not ultimately that thing. We're not the accumulation of our concepts or ideas, but the concepts and ideas shape our actions and who we are and how we navigate the world. And so mm -hmm. we have to become aware of them. Otherwise we become the victims of our own ideas. Uh, you know, if we don't really, <laughs> if we don't really assess them, you know, and, but that, that also means that we have to assess them from a perspective. And the question is what perspective it is that we are assessing them from. Okay. So let's take an idea. Let's just do it. Okay. Um, it's really important to go to college. You must go to college. College makes you a better man. That's an idea. That is. Now you totally said if we idea. if we don't evaluate it, you said we become a victim of right. maybe a, a poor thought. How would we evaluate that thought in your mind? I think that we have to take into account the fact that not everybody is uh, meant to go to the kind of education that a college provides in the United States, for example, right now. Mm -hmm. And to 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 make them feel as if they're less of a person uh, because they don't, I don't think it's 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 it's, it's just. It's, I don't think it's it's, it's right. How would um, a and so for example for example a vocational school? Why isn't a vocational venue as emphasized? You know, uh, because perhaps a person who has the capacity to be a carpenter or a, a, a an electrician. You know, they, they could excel and actually provide their own immediate culture and society uh, with with their talent and their services in ways that if they try to fit into the niche of like a college education and the liberal arts or whatever, they, they would be miserable and they wouldn't really be uh, providing their society with so, the best so, of themselves. So you're someone who kind of went outside of the norm by becoming a monk. How would you counsel that 18-year-old who's not sure? How can they know what's good in that decision-making process? Is it, is it some sort of silence or prayer? Like, how do, you come, how do you become aware of the cultural baggage that you're pulling behind you? How do you do well, that's that's difficult. I mean, it, it, because a lot of it is it's both... Uh, a, a voluntary assessment that you have to uh, embark upon. Um, and also it has to do with your own experiences and uh, providence, how uh, through your, your life you encounter circumstances that call you to make that assessment. How you did know? you do it? How did I, you change I, right. course yeah, or that's, whatever? That's, that's, uh, I knew you when that was happening, you know, I first met, yeah, met yeah, you when did. that was happening, That's you know, right. uh, and that was when I went to graduate school and I, I was going to Hunter College for you know, my master's in, in, in painting. And, and um, that was at the same time that I was, you know, becoming orthodox. And so my involvement with painting and, uh, you know, embarking on a career as, as a painter uh, as an artist in New York, was put in play with my embarking on on my commitment as an Orthodox Christian, mm -hmm. and so uh, that precipitated a whole bunch of questions as to what was my purpose as a painter, what what I wanted to do, what I wanted to communicate, what it ultimately what significance and meaning it had, and. Um, in light of uh, ultimate questions, you know, mm -hmm. my relationship with my immediate community uh, as, as, as part of a church 
and my, of course, my relationship with God. That already there is plenty to to ponder on, you know. And so that's what I was doing. I was I so was, it was hitting you, know, you. These things were coming. They right. Were, they were. They were. They were spiritual and me- and mental and physical realities. Right. And, and right. you had to like assess and come to some sort of clarity on them. That happened exactly. To you. Exactly. And um. And so and that that also touches on. Uh, your your theme of of old world and 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 new world because uh, you know with with the orthodox perspective and and image making in an orthodox context with icon painting for example is totally different than the kind of painting and art activity that I was involved in and so, so I began to see more clearly the, the the dichotomy between those two things. All right, let's lay this out. Right, let's lay this out right now. Okay. So one of the premise, because you write up to the point where I think I got to ask this question, or I got to give okay. a little context. So first things foundation is our work. We're out in the field, Peace Corps style. We're trying to find really local people who are really, really, really good at vision in local communities that have been isolated and forgotten. And when we find them, what we try to do is sort of use new world tools to bring them resources they need to continue to build their old world culture. And in some ways, what we see is, is there's lessons on both sides. And so the reason, this is the number one reason I want to put you on the show right now is when I knew you, you were fundamentally one of the, I think, and the people who know you would say this, I don't know what was going on with your abilities as a painter. They were incredible. Now, you're not supposed to hear that as a priest, but it's fundamentally fact. And watching you paint, I can remember one painting in particular. It was uh, Bailey's Irish Cream or something being poured <laughs> out. Do you remember that thing? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so come on now, work with me. <laughs> yeah, this brother's my godson, by the way. So this, <laughs> he's a priest and a higher monk and all that, but he's also my godson because we were getting to know each other at right. the same time. So. I went to your I went to your gallery in New York City and there it was. And I remember my wife and I stood and looked at that thing. Bro, the skill in it was okay, off the chart. It was an incredible thing. But I remember you in years after that literally telling me I put that aside. Yeah, and so yeah. there's a new world concept of this profoundly modern. What would we yeah. call that painting? Was it was it, it was like, postmodern abstraction, but you know it, it that's basically the general category that you could place it in. Okay, good. So, and then here comes this artist who retains his artistry, but is rejecting something. So can you just speak on what did you reject? It's something, but what did you retain? What, right, what have right. you retained? Yes. Because the the new world's not evil. The new world's just what, what it is. So right. what can you say about that painting and how it, it isn't, any more a part of what you do why is that well i think we have to take it back to uh or contrast the two ideas of artistic activity as you would have had it and still do have in traditional cultures around the world uh, and the changes that occurred in the 18th century uh, we were talking about this uh, last week. Basically, in 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 classical antiquity, for example, uh, you have you don't have the notion of fine art with a capital F and A. Mm-hmm. You have what what you have is techne, which is skill, is a set of principles, a specific knowledge that you have uh, in order to make something. It's a way of bringing things into being, like Aristotle would say. It's a way of imprinting a form on matter or fitting things together in in the right way in order for it to serve a specific function. Okay, so, so for example, in, in, in Latin is ars, which is skill. So in the... The, the the ancient notion of, uh, of techne or, or art as a set of principles, a knowledge of making things, would then render a, a a cultural setting where you would have different 
everybody in some way practicing some kind of art. So, for mm. example, you have the art of beer making, the art of farming, the art of weaving, the art of painting, sculpture, uh, the art of rhetoric, the art of teaching. So there is different ways of applying your your skill uh, in order to do something that is functional. It has some utility, and it is for it's for the purpose of for for the good of man, meaning for to meet a specific need. And this need could either be intellectual or it could be physical. Is that okay? artisan? Is that artisan? Exactly. So, so okay. the artist and the artisan, the craftsman and the artist in the classical, late antiquity, and the medieval world was one and the same thing. Mm-hmm. So, so for example, uh, uh, Ananda Kumaraswamy, who is, you know, he was born in 19th century. He he became the curator and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. He wrote a lot about the traditional concept of art. And a a, a famous quotation by him is, uh, in in the traditional context, every everyone was an artist. Like the the artist is not mm-hmm. a special kind of man. But every man is a special kind of artist. Wow. See, so that's the that's the that's one of the distinctions. So in the modern conception, you have art for art's sake. You have uh, the artist as a genius and art for the sake of self-expression, for example. And you have a dichotomy made between fine art as being ultimately useless. And and insofar as it's useless, is is valuable, and so because beauty, it's useless. Uh, what's that? Because it's fine and useless. Exactly. So so beauty is divided from utility. Is this why parents tell their kids don't do that? Because it's it's it, oh, I want to be an artist and go to school for that. Parents have imbibed. New world parents have imbibed. That's useless. Yeah, right. It, it's 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 part. It's totally partly related to that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it implies a bohemian kind of life. It right. implies like not having a stable income. So, in the in the old world, the mechanical arts were set up against the liberal arts, right? And so, uh, the mechanical arts were frowned and looked down upon as as being manual because the servants or craftsmen that got dirty would invite, you know, it's a lower class kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Liberal arts was for the free man, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so in uh, the Renaissance, you have the painters and sculptors and architects uh, wanting to have the privilege of the liberal arts. And so you begin the process with the Renaissance of differentiating the fine arts from the mechanical arts. I see. And that that actually comes to fruition uh, in the 18th century with theories on beauty and the sublime, like you have it in Kant, and then uh, the idea of aesthetic pleasure uh, as having a value of its own, completely disassociated from uh, any ideological purpose of the image or religious purpose or any kind of like uh, desire purpose in, in terms of it having some kind of appetitive or functional role. Is this why um, we think we can go to a museum and great find great pleasure out of a piece of art, say from Buddhist tradition or Muslim yes, tradition, exactly. or even like Jackson Pollock right. and go, oh, I really got a lot out of that. Yes, exactly. And so I'm glad that you mentioned the whole, the, the, the Buddhist art, uh, you grouped it together with Jackson Pollock because ultimately the museum serves to neutralize the objects of the ancient world and the old world because it aestheticizes the object and and decontextualizes the art object. And so you no longer see it for its function. You see it for its purely aesthetic pleasure that you derive from it. And so, but in the ancient world, the fact that uh, a thing was beautiful was related to its function. If it, if it actually lived up to serving the purpose that it was meant to serve, then it was beautiful. It w- if it was not, it Give was not considered beautiful. 
Like, for example, a classic one is brought up in the Middle uh, Ages in this scholastic context by Aquinas. And, and Aquinas, of course, he's deriving ideas from Aristotle. Catholic and theologian, it, 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 yeah, 1200s, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so you could say that a lot of what Aquinas says in terms of uh, aesthetics or, or, or art is pretty much a, a synthesis that he does with uh, the ideas of uh, classical antiquity and uh, the ideas of the medieval period. So they're not ultimately his own ideas. They're, he's just basically collecting all this. And so he says that it doesn't matter how beautiful a glass, a saw is. You might think it is beautiful, but it, it is not because it doesn't serve its purpose. Ah, okay. So, so, so for a saw to actually be beautiful, it should cut well. Wood. <laughs> it should live, it should, exactly, it should live up to what it purports to be. It is also, the whole idea of, of beauty in that context also, you could look at it as the splendor of perfection. Like if the artifact actually is well formed according to the idea that is supposed to embody, then it is beautiful. It. If it is formless, if it doesn't function right, and if it actually doesn't com conform to the idea in living up to what it should be, then the ancient, uh, in the ancient context or in the traditional context, it would just be frowned upon as marred, as not, so, not serving its purpose. So to bring it home, talk about what you paint, icons. Right, in the right, Eastern right. tradition of Christianity, the Orthodox tradition, how does it, how is it not useless? Because I think a lot of people, uh, probably even on this pod, would be like, I, I don't get it. It's just a painting and sitting there. Yeah. How, how is it? Well, I don't get I it. How does it live up to its to its its ideal? Yeah. So so this is also related to the uh, you bringing up the. Buddhist art in comparison to Jackson Pollock. Oh, okay, right? sure, yeah. Because okay. let me let me wrap that up, and then it sex ways straight into what what you're asking now okay. is uh, the Buddhist culture, for example, served a specific religious function in its culture, and the specific form that it takes is based on the metaphysical concepts of Buddhism. For you to be able to understand that sculpture. You have to learn about the ideas behind Buddhism mm -hmm. and practice. So, and, and exact, and see it within the whole universe of the Buddhist uh, world. And similarly with iconography, iconography, like a Buddhist sculpture or an icon of Jesus Christ, they serve a specific function. They are functional as they help you in your contemplation of mm -hmm. the specific person that it represents or the specific narrative doctrinal concepts that the image is conveying. It, and place, so they, it places you in an ethos. It, exactly. it puts you into a, a frame of mind, a, a spiritual a frame, frame of, mind, of mind. And you enter into the doctrinal dimensions of the faith and you also enter into a relationship with those the the persons being depicted and so there is a in the in, in terms of iconography there is uh also the doctrinal basis of the icon as being predicated on the incarnation of christ you know he will he became incarnate and so therefore you could depict god in so far as he became incarnate mm -hmm. and so in that sense you're also entering into a connection with the heavenly realm mm -hmm. because getting back to you the question of your you know your lightometer yeah like, yeah that's what <laughs> i want to do actually <laughs> right, i'm right. looking at it <laughs> yeah but it, so so it, you know you're depicting a holy person and this person is not physically in your presence they are in the kingdom of heaven but through their image they're made present and so you're entering into a conversation with them you're entering into a relationship with them they inhabit your own physical and spiritual sphere at that moment. So hold and on. So you, oh, oh, I got to interrupt you for one second. No problem. No problem. So does this, can we, that's, because you know, I'm always trying to walk it down or back 
or into a place where we can have a, a cultural conversation. So if I put grandma on the wall, right. And my friend comes over, but they're, they're a new friend. They don't know anything about me or my grandmother. I stand in front of the picture and, and can fully or more fully enter into the picture and know her as present in a different way than my friend who's looking maybe at her jacket and saying, Oh, look at the lapels. They're, they're so nice. They're not able to know the presence of the person because they haven't done some sort of praxis with the person in relationship to the person. In other words, the picture on the wall of, of grandma is not as a, a real or alive to them or am I not getting I that think, right? I think, I think it, it, it also depends on the disposition of the person. I mean, I could enter into a church and completely aestheticize the icons and not, not engage with them in any, in, in, in any in real the same sense. way with the picture. This, of right. Right. So you have to put yourself in that frame of mind. Just like if you're going to be doing prayers, you could say them either with your lips or with your heart. And so you have to enter into that. But I think intuitively in our culture, we know that there is a link between the person represented and the image. I mean, not to get political, but the fact that people are destroying images all around right, right, the country right, right now that. demonstrates that, demonstrates that. It's just, you know, it's 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 just part of image making that there is a mysterious link that that there is between the represented and and the image do you think new world artists would say that someone totally disconnected from the traditions of the old world and, and iconography you studied with folks who were you know thoroughly modern are they doing something different when they paint yeah they they are in a way in so far as the paradigm is completely different as i was I was saying earlier, the art is considered to be a thing on its own, art for art's sake, mm -hmm. and it is it's 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 a cultural sphere that only a few people basically navigate, and 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 it's it's philosophically like involved. It's uh it's very esoteric in a lot of in a lot of ways for people who are not involved in it, and so. They are, they're creating a lot of, in a lot of ways art about art. Okay. And there are different art worlds within the art world also, depending on, on your immediate context, intellectually, culturally, what issues it is, are at stake for you. You will be creating work oriented towards that, but it is for a very specific gallery oriented market and you are pretty much playing along the rules of that cultural niche mm -hmm. and that the rules are very specific because for you to be able to succeed as a painter within that environment you have to play along the rules and so the the goal is for you to get into a gallery and from a gallery to a museum and god willing from the museum you know for you to become, you know. What's the painting to you? You know, like the 25-year-old artist who's done well in school. Are they painting it in the same way you're trying to make make incarnate, uh, I don't know, the Theotokos or, or Christ or whoever you're painting, in the same way you're trying to bring them into presence? Right. Is that what a, a modern artist without the, the tradition of the old world is trying to do, in your humble opinion? What would you say there? I agree the, the cultural and the professional aspects are, are daunting and it changes the game. But in the purest sense, what's that artist trying to do in your in your experience, the young artist? What, what's the point of art for them as they sit well, with their... Part, part of the problem is I think that you cannot answer that question <sighs> As, what was it for you before you were right? I, I think that's the you see, and that's the key. The key is that it's very fragmentary. I see because it means different things for different people. Got it. And that's why I was alluding to the whole thing of like different art worlds in the art world. Because depending on what your values are, what your if you're into political art, you're gonna be doing different kind of artwork, and you're gonna mm -hmm. be considering your work to be of importance because you want to make uh, cultural changes. And you think your work will actually actualize that or help mm -hmm. in actualizing that. If you're doing figurative work, 
You know, there is a revival on classical painting right now. That's a completely different sphere. You're going to be interested in beauty according to classical standards. And in that case, you might be approximating some degree of iconography insofar as you're depicting the figure or Got you're it. doing portraits, you see? Mm -hmm. But then you, ha you have an abstract painter and he doesn't care about presence in, the, in, in that sense, you know? As an iconographer or a figurative painter would, they would be interested in the formal qualities of the, of the paint and how they come together in a composition or how that relates to the whole notion of the tradition of abstraction and, and the concepts behind that. So in other words, what you have in the fine art world as compared to the old world, you know, notion of techni and the artisan, mm -hmm. you, you, it, the artisan in the traditional uh, context would be in a much more uh, whole, co uh, how would I say? Holistic? His, his culture would not, exactly. His culture would not be as fragmented as our culture. Okay. And it would, not be, it would not be individualistic. And insofar as it's functional, it's serving the purpose of meeting the needs of that specific society. Okay, so here's a question, because I can hear a lot of people asking this. You mean their existence would be much more restricted compared to the freedom of a modern artist? Well, it, it, but then again, is what do we mean by freedom? we have to be careful with imposing our notions of freedom to like a traditional man, because in a traditional culture, in a tribe, a tribal culture, for example, your freedom is related to your ultimate metaphysic. That's the your one thing we have purpose. to remember. For example, okay, let me, uh, just this a quick, good. Go a with quick this. digression. Uh, I think there is a book that you have to check out because you've, you've done a lot of field work in Africa. Uh, it's called Conversations with Ogotomeli by Marcel Crayul. Okay. He's an anthropologist. And he basically interviewed this elder in a doggone uh, oh, uh, village. This book became a classic. I took this um, African art class in my undergrad. And, and this book was sort of like one of, one of the main books that we used. But the conversation that the anthropologist has with Ogotameli is very interesting because Ogotameli gives, he begins by giving the man the narrative of their mythology. Hmm. And based mm -hmm. on the narrative of the mythology, the various dimensions of the village organization is shaped. So where the buildings are, okay, their placement, how far they are from each other, where they are in terms of the center or periphery of the village. All of it relates to the uh, mythology of the Dogon people. And also you, the grain, the, the granaries. Is narrative? The, the, uh, the, the story. The, the, the story of the creation of the world and Got how mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the Dogon people factor into that mythology and mm -hmm, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And so the way that the architecture of a granary, for example, is laid out, the way it's built, how, you know, the Aaron Smith's workshop, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the way that the body is interpreted, everything pertains to the general uh, metaphysic that is not systematically or philosophically laid out, but is contained within the folkloric narratives of their stories, of their mythology. So and I so called that history in the past podcast. History, maybe not, it's not really the word in the new world. But the his story, the story actually of the people is coming through in, and I think you're saying in the art of the people. Yes, the exactly. Artisans. Yes. In yes. everything they're doing. Okay. Okay. So 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 then that's a completely game. That's a, it's a whole different game. It's, it's it's a game changer because we have a secular culture and we have fragmented interpretations of reality. And the art is completely disassociated from, from any metaphysical significance. It is more on the realm of individualistic kind of expression or e each telling their own story. Exactly. So each, their each own person, culture. exactly. Each whoa, person, whoa. each person becomes the 
storyteller of his own mythology, so to speak. And 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 wow. he develops or she develops their own set of symbols. And that's why it's extremely difficult to go to a contemporary art gallery or museum because we are disconnected from the symbolism of these art objects because we don't know what the artist is saying ultimately because wow. they're you know wow. they're they're coming up with their own interpretations of but reality. hold on hold on though father because this is is this could you say this you got to help me because i go sideways but in the same way the artisan in the dogan village i've been to those villages by the way it's intense all made out of stone uh in the same way the artisan in the Dogon village is not, quote, free to tell a story other than the narrative or other than the story of his people of the village. Are we not really free to tell any other story in the modern world? I'm free to tell whatever I want, but ultimately, aren't I just a sort of slave to my own narrative anyway? Right. So, so that's totally related. You know, uh, I mean, getting back to the beginning, it's like, like I said, it's like, what do we call freedom? It's, you can't impose on the old world or traditional man, you know, our own paradigm of what we think freedom is. So, uh, wow. you know, for the doggone artisan, he's being extremely free in so far as he is navigating within the mythos of his people. And in so far as he finds a place within that mythos, he, he finds his meaning. He finds the meaning of his place within that culture. Mm -hmm. And so if you disconnect him from that and you put him in a secular context, he'll be lost. Mm -hmm. And he will find it oppressive because he wouldn't have the matrix of significance of symbolic structures for him to actually make sense of the reality he finds himself at now. Whoa. And so it would become oppressive. Ooh, could I say it, something it, about that? Yeah. I know this is true because I... In my history, in my life, I've done this, but we've also, as first things have sent 14 people now into that kind of environment. And every time they go, guess what happens? What happens? Total confusion. Yeah, totally, man. Total rejection. And then this deep and profound metanoia, this change where they go, who the hell am I? Right. right. <laughs> because you're yeah. getting stripped. You're right. It happens. Yeah, because it's, it's paradigm, it's paradigm clash. You're used to functioning within a specific set of comfort zones based on a different, completely different paradigm. You're entering into a new one and the, the rhythm is different. Like, you know, one of your podcasts, you were talking about silence. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Silence becomes oppressive because like you're not used to silence, for example. And the relationship dimensions are different. The way people interact is different. Um, and so you begin to feel more vulnerable. And you begin to feel more like, you know, like you're not, you're not in charge anymore, man. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's very difficult. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is all, it's all related to how we make things, how we organize our lives, mm -hmm. how we organize our daily routines. So you art's know? not on a wall. Art is, it's, it's alive in the activities of the culture. Yes. And even in our new world culture, it's the same, right? On some level. In some level it is, but it is different insofar as the assumption within the paradigm of fine art, okay. as, it, as we have it now, sets up a dichotomy between art and life. And so the interesting thing is that in, in the history of modern art, you have had a, a, uh, a sub-narrative, so to speak, if you want to call it that, of the struggle of the artist with with the dichotomy of his art making and life and so dichotomy some, here being a battle of some sort of uh, right right tension so so for example Bauhaus movement a german school of artists and designers and architects and the weimar republic it was closed down by the nazis part of what they were trying to do is revive the old notion of the craftsman mm -hmm. and the old notion of cooperative work where uh, you know the artisans would come together to build society um, contributing their own set of skills so instead of seeing each individual artist somehow isolated they wanted to 
model themselves after the cathedral builders of the medieval period. Okay. So that's the, in, in the modern period, that's an example. And also the William Morris uh, arts and crafts movement also has tried to, to heal the rift between art and life. So, so there is that. And also in, in, in more like radical after Marcel Duchamp, right? You have after the seventies movements of performance art and the questioning of the role of the museum where you have exhibitions that involve the viewer participating in the art objects themselves in order, you know, bridge the gap between art and life. That's a reclamation project. Exactly. And so, so in it, you see that it both functions as, yes, we're critiquing this, but we're still functioning within the paradigm that, you know, which advances that the art museum is disconnected from life. Right. But when the village, when you do something, when you're weaving, for example, you know, it, it's, it's a metaphysic. It's a horizontal and the vertical plane coming together. And you're seeing it within your mythology, for example. Wow, that's cool. You know, and that's so cool. all this, all these different crafts are related to your needs in life, but also related to your beliefs. Well, I always had this thought, Father, that why didn't like – the Dogon or the, the Bomber or pick people. Why don't we just go to their museums and just get their stuff? Because they didn't have them. <laughs> like why aren't, why, right. aren't art, why aren't art from the old world just passed from museum to museum, 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 museum to the new world museum? Because there were no museums. That's why you have to recover them, right? There is no place they were kept because they were uh, actually being used. Right, right, exactly. They served a specific... Uh, ritual or civic function to to help upbuild the cohesiveness of their society. Right. So wait in for one second. You can mm-hmm. put on the brakes if you want. But what's going on today then? Do we have, if everyone, what was your great quote? Is that you uh, the, become, the quote, the oh, artist the quote, yeah, the the, the, always, the the artist is not a special kind of man, but every man is a special kind of artist. Right. I think today, at least the students I've taught, young and old, would hear that and say yes, but then none of them would say that when they swept the kitchen or when they, I don't know, read a book or whatever, they didn't think of themselves as an artist in that moment. Yes, they, that's they right. They thought of that's, themselves as right. Like, because, I don't know, working. Because, because uh, ironically, the paradigm of fine art has elevated the artist to a point of almost making him a, a, a religious kind of prophetic figure. You know, who wants to be the sweeper? They, <laughs> I would, know everybody's they, they, they would rather be like the, the great mystic who has some illumination that w- they want to impart to the world because they are special. You know what I'm saying? But then why, does, <laughs> why is there such a refrain? in schools, especially with young people, why is there such a refrain that you are somebody? It seems weird. It seems like we gutted that notion in the new world. And now we've come back to it in order to cover up a hole or something. Like if the old world was saying every man is an artisan, I don't think people believe that right now, father. I I think they say it though. There's the self-esteem concept that's everywhere, which is I have something to say, but then if you say Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you get my question? Which is, if you have a lot to say, wouldn't that come out in everything you do as an artisan? But uh, it doesn't. I'm confused. right. Right. Maybe I'm not we're, helping we're, here. No. 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 I think. I think there is. Save a, me. The problem that we're uh, touching on right now is the dichotomy between community and individuality. In a traditional society, you have the individual as an integral part of the community. They, they did not set themselves apart from the community. So the problem that we have now is that there is individualism that is the predominant kind of like a, a standard that, that gets in the way of finding value in what you're doing, uh, such as sweeping, sweeping the, 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 the street. You you don't, you don't think that that's of any self aggrandizing uh, purpose or meaning. And so you're not really that interested in doing a service to the community. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it touches on service and it touches on the the way we perceive ourselves as either integrally part of the people around us or not yeah and yeah. so and i think that's that's i think the kernel of the problem uh, getting back to the whole life and art dichotomy uh, there was a german uh, artist called joseph boys he was very important he did, he was he did performance art he was also a sculptor he had an idea that resembled that statement by Kumaraswamy because he he wanted to instill in people to his performances and his sculpture and his uh, philosophy of art. He wanted to instill in people social responsibility. Mm. And he coined this concept. He called it the social sculpture. And he says that we begin to sculpt our society by first beginning to sculpt ourselves. And so it takes art from making this object for the museum or the gallery and brings it back to the problem of Mm self-transformation and in self-transforming, changing society around you, which is interesting because in that regard, it parallels completely with a Christian understanding of the role of the person and the community. Yeah, right. I was just thinking it's, that. It's, it's, it's uncanny because you wouldn't think that that idea would arise from a modern new world art context. Mm-hmm. But, it, but, but, but Joseph Boyce, you know, I, I guess in his honesty, he, he, he runs into it in, in his humanity. He inadvertently runs into the problem of we have to first address crafting myself as part of my community. Right. So in that sense, the community becomes a tool where almost it becomes a, a, um, like a speed bump for your salvation because it forces you to work on something that's relevant to those around you beyond yourself, which forces you into a contemplation of self. In other words, the community allows you to have a place to both fail and then learn about your failings. Because on your yes, own, exactly. how can you know? How can you right. know on your own? Right, right. We're, we're social creatures. We're relational creatures. We're meant for communion with each other. We're meant to love. Right. You know, remember that, that, that old uh, saying, I think therefore I am, right? Yeah. And oh, there we, is, there is, the there is, there is a, a refutation of that. Um, I forgot who coined it. It goes, I love, therefore I am, uh, you know? And so that's, that's the important crux of the matter. If we start from that, then our, our understanding of the question of the self, our individuality, our personhood, right? And, and its role in relationship to community, it, it clarifies it. So in some ways, Descartes, I think, therefore I am, has become, I, th- I love myself, Therefore yes. I am. It's but I think you're saying I love others, therefore I am. Yes, because I come to an understanding of who I truly am by foregoing the self-limiting dimensions of myself, which are selfishness, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. self-love, mm-hmm. Uh, in the negative sense of it being complete self-absorption. Mm-hmm. which ends up in nihilism because ultimately it it is an isolation that is overbearing mm-hmm. and it it leads it leads to depression and it leads to suffering and you know and only when we are willing to actually serve others open ourselves to communion and relationship with others in a process of giving like what the foundation is doing mm-hmm. then do we actually learn what I've I've uh, distorted in myself that I have, I have, I have learned to take for granted. I've drunk the Kool-Aid of, of a paradigm that like actually destroys me, but I, I won't be able to actually see it for what it is unless I confront other people. I have to deal with their weaknesses and their challenges mm-hmm. and, and see how that challenges me to give up myself in ways that otherwise I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the opportunity. So, so what would you say? Someone says, I don't care what other people think. Just people say that all the time. I say it all the time. I don't care what they think. 
On some level, actually, they're there so that you might know what they think so that you have to pause. Would you agree with that? I agree. I agree. That's what, you know. And the oh, thing that is that sucks, we have, though, right? Yeah, yeah, right. That it, sucks. But, but that's why that's why that's why uh, it's it's more romantic, you know, to aggrandize the bohemian artist than to talk about the artisan. Yeah, because the bohemian artist is like basically li- uh, uh, freedom as license to do anything and everything you want. Mm-hmm. Whereas the artisan is like, no, I have a set of responsibilities. And, and in culture begins with work and worship. <laughs> so so you put those things together, you have a, a cohesive culture. Well, you, in you, the you East, set them apart. You, you know, you have a fragmented individualistic culture, you know. So in the East, liturgy, worship means work. Yeah, right? exactly. That's the work of the people. Yeah. yeah. So last so, question. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Father. Uh, community and uh, and 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 individuality are are often set apart, but they're uh, they're complementary. Mm. They're coexisting principles that you cannot be asundered apart. And so, I think that is the key for us to understand better the role of art mm-hmm. and understand how we should shape our lives mm-hmm. for us to be ultimately more joyful let me ask you this let's turn to this and then maybe we finish up people out there if you listen, if you saw father walk into your like, car rental or into the grocery store he's wearing a long black cassie he's got a big long beard it lo- hey father it's turning gray i like it i know it's like kind of mostly honorable or mostly something. gray <laughs> <laughs> he's got a hat on i mean he kind of looks like i think some people would think he was muslim or something Father, you look like different, right? Okay. You fully entered into a type of traditional setting, a type of old world, a paradigm you're trying to put on and live within that you find beautiful. We don't have to talk about that. I know I find it beautiful too. But what is it about the, the new world as it per this show, the way we define it? What, what would you say? Yeah, I'm pretty thankful to have been born at this time in this hour in this world with these ideas. Is there anything about it that you say, Hey, I took it into the monastery with me or am I, am I, am I framing that wrong? No, I think you're absolutely, you're absolutely hitting on something important because I think we have to remember that first of all, we, we have been born in the time that it was meant for each one of us to be born at. We can't argue against Providence. And we can't gripe against it. And so that is a given. And we just have to work with it. And it brings good and bad things on the table. But that is actually what contributes to the artisanal uh, dimension of, of shaping ourselves. To actually refine who we are actually meant to be. Wow. If we didn't have challenges, I mean, and the thing is, we have to remember also that even within the old world context, they had their challenges, they had their limitations, or still have, you know, in different parts of the world, they have their suffering. You know, we we, we have to be careful with, you know, developing a an over romanticized idea that like it's pretty much a, a version of Rousseauian kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah. No, notions, you know, of. of of the noble savage and things like that, you know? And Mm -hmm. so there are things that we can learn definitely from old world, but there are also things that the old world could uh, learn from the new world, Mm -hmm. you know? And so we have to be, be precise as to what these things are. And as I said in the beginning, we have to, for us to be able to, to discern that we have to start from first principles. And that's the hard thing is to find which, are the first principles that we're going to be using to to look at these things but mm-hmm. i'm very grateful that you know of you know some of the technological things that we have in our culture but they there are also problems you know uh, do you our, use our, them in your paintings is there something uh, about your paintings that's that's new <laughs> well 
uh, listen, I have many more colors. I mean, the yeah, kind of colors right. available to me now are not the kind of colors that a medieval craftsman would have had. Yeah, that's and true. so you know, and so you know, that's a little example. But uh, remember the green you used in the Saint Nino you painted for us? Oh Lord, it was incredible. Uh, There's a green, and you did a green. Oh yeah, that's right. too, yeah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm taking a. Le- I just uh, I love um, his work. Anyhow, so that's that's one thing that I think we have to keep in mind. The fact, I think, that you have a foundation that is helping out people in the old world is itself a good example of new world coming in, in, in contact with the old world yeah, and a positive dimension of the new world uh, being given, offered to the old world in a way that is not in an aggressive arrogant colonialistic kind of like way that, it's it's it's, it's six it seeks to heal uh, you know the wrongs in that 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 have been inflicted that's, in that regard that, you know that's, that's it, and brother. so and so that's the the that's another thing and so we as people coming from the you know from the context that we've been given to dwell in and live in we have to also take into consideration that a lot of the aberrations that we find in uh, our society and culture, uh, as a Christian, I could say this, that, you know, they are distortions of Christian ideals, you know, the, the, the important, like the importance of the individual, for example, of the person, uh, it, you know, it, it becomes this in Christianity becomes distorted as individualism in secular society, you know, mm-hmm. the value of reason, the fathers of the church speak about man as logicos, the lo- you know, man as logicos, being a yeah. given, given, he's, he's been given logos. He's been given reason to be able to uh, exercise control as a, as a charioteer with his mind over his lower impulses, like his appetites, you know, mm-hmm. his desires and his, mm-hmm. his impulses of, of anger and things like that as a charioteer steers a, the horses in his chariot. So that has been distorted by the Enlightenment as a fixation and idolatry on, on reason. Uh, and and it, has, it has also distorted man's faculty as logicos. Uh, it has made uh, his rational capacity as totally earthly, relegated to abstract concepts and measurable uh, yeah, we talk about you know, that a lot. Me- me- measuring and 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 mm-hmm, in a, mm-hmm. you know, hence scientism and things like that. But but then in in the traditional cultures, you know, not only in orthodoxy but in different different systems in different parts of the world, you have a higher lo- a logical faculty, the deuce, the noetic faculty, which is supra rational. It yes. embraces reason, but is 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 higher insofar as it is close to you know, the divine. And so Mm -hmm. it, it, spiritual intellect, spiritual intellect. Exactly. And so, you know, so on and so forth. So you have, uh, various distortions that unfold post the enlightenment in our secular history and our immediate culture right now, not, not evil, but but distorted, distorted. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and the fact, for example, uh, you have to also take into account the, our legal system, and democracy, for example, it's, it could be an exaggeration of the communal in Christianity. Mm-hmm. You know, it becomes extremely exaggerated in communism at the expense of the role of the individual. And in our capitalist context, then it is individualism becomes, it's you know, distorted. overemphasized, you know. So so these are all distortions of, and they contain some kernel of truth. But they have been exaggerated to the point where it compromises the complementary dimension that brings balance to the whole picture. And so that, you, you know. You know what, though, Father? If we go that? back all the way to the beginning, when you took the lightometer test, I, yes. should, I should let you know something. What's that? Is your score is actually right exactly in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> so right, right. that that's really interesting because I think a lot of people, I mean if they take this test seriously, I kind of I kind of joke about it. I mean it's not science, right? But but if you take it seriously, 
on some level. And by the way, it really does. It tracks with a lot of my friends who, who have taken in a lot of the listeners. To be in the middle, it might be the right place to be on some level. Uh, well, vir- virtue is the mean between two extremes. Yeah, man. That's a classical. I think that comes That's from Aristotle, Aristotle too. It's, Aristotle. <laughs> right. so, it's it's the it's the media. It's that it's the royal path. That's right. That's it's right. The, it's the center. So may may it be so. But in the end, you want to do this again sometime. Yeah, let's do it again. I mean, it's, uh, thank you for having me, by the way. I think it's important that your foundation is doing the work that it's doing. It calls us to wake up. Sometimes, you know, we get a little bit too carried away in our self-indulgence, you know, with, with, you know, with the blessings that we've had, we take for granted. We have many blessings in our culture, and um, yes, we, but we have to use those blessings to serve other people as well. And not to just basically pamper ourselves. And I think uh, your foundation is is giving the opportunity for people who are called to do so to do so. And uh, you know that's very important. Well, I'll take that as pretty much the best thing I could ever hear on this pod. So here, here's what what you and I'll do. We'll promise to do a second one. Okay. Um, and um, I didn't take you into the culture wars. A lot going on right now, but. Yeah, I'm not good with culture wars because I'm not good with the how do you call it uh, the the politics so, so much. Well, I think I, I think it touches on part of what we we have discussed, you know, in yes. terms of mm-hmm. principles. You know, yeah. I, I'm better with general principles, but in terms of the minutia of like you know uh, law and political structures and you know the way the system works and mm-hmm. so on and so mm-hmm. forth, I get lost in the details. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, but, uh, I think it's the opposite. I think you actually lift us out of the, the morass. So I want to give some uh, a, a great big thanks to the folks at the monastery, uh, including uh, your abbot, um, Father Maximus, Father Maximus, for uh, letting you come on. And um, we'll do it again. And I think the most important thing is, is what you said uh, earlier in the pod that yeah, I mean, in the end, we're just artisans trying to work on ourselves and yes. <laughs> think about that task. There's Definitely. a lot in that, you know? But that's a, that's an important thing because uh, one last thing before we go. Oh, good. The Rip whole it. beauty thing, the whole beauty thing is important. Yeah. Because if we work on ourselves, we become beautiful, man. Mm-hmm. And we become beautiful. Everybody around us will notice that splendor of of the perfection that we have actually actualized in in the divine and then then that would spread and that's part of what you want to do in in in, in this First life things, yeah but hey listen that actually may be the next conversation because that might actually be what this life is for exactly right yeah you know the funny thing is like in the classical antiquity Beauty was mainly associated with uh, a moral dimension, hence the philokalia, right? Right. And it, it was about having attained to a certain level of like nobility of soul. And it was also an attribute of God. It wasn't an aesthetic thing so much as we've right. turned it into. Right, right. Of course, it does have that dimension, but but it was predominantly having to do with an ontological category. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, that's another conversation. But that's well, Plato thing. talked about the ladder of of beauty going up the ladder, and yeah, as you went further up the ladder, you actually notice less and less about people's appearance, less and less about architecture. And Gregory of Nyssa picks up on that too. Same. On, uh, that's right. On virginity, he's text uh, with Macrina. I think he's having a conversation about it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a very important thing. That's a very important topic because that uh, brings the whole artisanal thing. The working on the self, the mm-hmm. uh, the craftsmanship of self to the the beauty dimension of like you know attaining uh, divine likeness, and then how that in our service to others, like the foundation is doing, you're bringing beauty to those cultures, and it's actually helping beautify our own souls. I mean, it's very that's very very important. May it may it be so. All right, Father. For all these years we've known each other. Remember, I am your godfather. Uh, That's right. That's right. You pray for me. I pray for you. You got to pray for me. That's right. (laughs) 
Hey, you got to pray for me. All right, stay on the line while I run it out. Everybody, okay. thanks for thanks for being here, Father. Father uh, Silouan, he's in New York. He's an artist. You can check out our pod notes. On the pod notes, you'll find some links to his icons, to, to the work they're doing to, uh, at the monastery. To all of y'all, this is uh, Watar. Why are we talking about rabbits? Sheni Skagi Marjos to you. That means to you the victory, often said at the KP table in Georgia. That's our pod for today. Thanks for coming along. This show is produced by Andrew Schwark and Daniel Paternos. Our pod is brought to you by the creators of First Things Foundation. And our work is to send people from all different cultures, but predominantly from the new world into the old world, wherever it may be, including right here in the United States. We have pockets of it. And there we immerse and we create momentum for local people who want to change their lives and the lives of their co- the folks who live in their communities. So share Watar with friends. Hit us up with a solid review on iTunes and everywhere you get your podcasts. Your love for us allows us to love and serve others. Nachvam dis, kambufo. Father, how would you say it in Spanish in your native Puerto Rican? Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Hasta That's luego. Right. <laughs> and to everybody, thanks for tuning in. See you uh, next week. <laughs>